I'm Alex Stevenson, the lead designer of Travelers of Storia. Travelers of Storia is a one to four player, fully cooperative campaign board game with elements of both deck building fantasy card games and Dungeons and Dragons. The game takes place on Storia, a planet thousands of times bigger than Earth, occupied by all types of humans and humanoids. Strewn all across Storia is the Nexus. Nexus gates are one-way teleportation tunnels that transport whoever enters to a random Nexus gate somewhere else on the planet. Those who take to the Nexus are known as Travelers, mighty legendary wanderers. The first campaign, Clan Black Core, will focus on the conflict between Fairhaven Kingdom, your homeland, and a mysterious newly formed Goblin Alliance. This tutorial will show you the game components, how to set up the game, then exploration and encounters for a single player campaign game. There are two zones of play in the game, the world map consisting of terrain cards, campaign event cards, and the nexus card, and the encounter board, where players will encounter and fight against enemy units. The remaining game cards and pieces consist of various beads, and two six-sided dice, world enemy cards encountered in terrain card encounters, campaign enemy cards encountered in campaign event encounters, treasure cards and traveler cards that are required throughout the game, campaign character cards that assist players in specific encounters, boss cards in which the objective of the game is to defeat all bosses, and finally, the four base classes which players choose between to play the mighty melee champions, the fortune-hunting adventurers, the just and honorable guardians, and the mighty story and energy-wielding rune mages. After choosing a class, look at the rating and map setup information for the first mission, located in the campaign logbook of the game. Since the rating is bronze, remove all silver and gold, world enemy, campaign enemy, treasure, and traveler cards from their decks, and set them aside for use later in the game. You can tell the rating of a card by looking at the bottom right corner, or by looking at the colored border surrounding the card info. Shuffle the bronze rated cards and place the decks in their labeled slots on the encounter board. Next we can see that this mission calls for 16 terrain cards, 3 campaign event cards, and 1 the nexus card to make up the world map. Randomly take 16 of the 20 terrain cards and shuffle them together with the campaign event and the nexus cards. These are placed face down next to the encounter board in the order shown in this diagram. Now that you've set up the game, you can begin exploring the world map. Place the clear bead, your squad counter, on any bordering world map card, then turn that card face up. Look at the world map card index in your campaign logbook to see which events occur. Many events are determined by rolling the two six-sided dice, otherwise follow the directions in the index for the world map card you've landed on. In this example, I've landed on the Colossal Peaks. After rolling a four, I have to face a world enemy random encounter plus three additional enemies, and the victory spoils are take a card from the treasure deck. In any random encounter, two enemies are faced for each player. Since this is single player, I have to face two enemies plus three additional enemies for a grand total of five enemies. Enemies are placed from the world enemy deck into the front row slots on the encounter board until all front row slots are filled. If more enemies still need to be placed, they are distributed amongst reserve slots as evenly as possible. Now that all enemies have been placed, I'm ready to take my first combat turn. I chose the champion class to play, took its combat deck, and shuffled it. On the first combat turn of any encounter, I place the top four cards of my combat deck into empty awaiting deployment slots on the encounter board. One combat turn follows these steps in this order. Take actions, decide attacks, roll for energy abilities, allied units attack, enemy units attack. Players take up to four actions each combat turn. Players can take actions to do a variety of things. Players take actions to deploy units into empty deploy slots. Each allied unit has an action cost located beneath the unit's name. Some units have action abilities. Players can take actions to use these abilities once per encounter. Once a unit has used its action ability, move it up in its slot to reveal the action ability expended text. 
Treasure cards also have action abilities, and players can take actions to use these abilities once per encounter as well. Once a treasure card has been used, move it from the active treasure slot into the expended treasure slot. Players can also take one action to take one card from their combat deck and put it in an empty awaiting deployment slot, or to take one card that's awaiting deployment, put it on the bottom of their combat deck, and replace it with the top card of their combat deck. Once a player has taken their actions, they need to decide which enemy units to attack with their deployed allied units. Use the colored bead that corresponds to the deploy slot occupied with their allied unit to indicate which enemy unit they would like to attack. Now that each player has taken actions and decided attacks, one player must roll the two dice to see which unit's energy abilities are used. Every unit in the game has an energy ability. When an allied unit's energy ability is rolled, use one of its energy abilities. When an enemy unit's energy ability is rolled, use its corresponding energy ability. Energy abilities are used and resolved in a specific order. Boss units first, then enemy units, then campaign characters, then allied units. After units have used their energy abilities, place damage counters, the small clear beads, equal to each allied unit's attack numbers, located in the axe symbol on the card, on the corresponding attacked enemy units that didn't evade this combat turn. If an enemy unit has damage counters on it equal to or more than its energy number, it's removed from the encounter board and shuffled back into its deck at the end of the encounter or if its deck becomes depleted. Finally, remaining enemy units will place damage counters equal to their attack numbers on attacked allied units that didn't evade this combat turn. Allied units with damage counters equal to or more than their energy numbers are fatigued or put in a discard pile beside the player's combat deck. Enemy units will always try and attack the allied unit directly below them on the encounter board. If no allied unit is deployed below an attacking enemy unit, that enemy unit will attack and fatigue units from each player's combat deck for as much as the enemy unit's attack number. If any player would have a card fatigued from their combat deck, but none remain, all players are defeated and must restart the encounter, including shuffling and placing enemy units again. When a front row enemy unit is fatigued, check for any reserve units connected to that front row slot. The connected reserve units will immediately come down and still attack if it's before the enemy unit's attack phase. If both front row enemy units are fatigued at the same time, players get to choose which front row slot the connected reserve enemy will come down into. When all enemy units in an encounter are fatigued, each player places their deployed units and their units awaiting deployment on the bottom of their combat decks in any order. Players then shuffle all expended bronze and silver rated treasure into the treasure deck, then return all gold rated treasure to the active treasure slot, and then receive any victory spoils for the encounter. Players then continue moving their squad counter on the world map. When players have successfully explored all campaign event cards and defeated the boss, players shuffle all their fatigued units back into their combat decks, receive any rewards for their achievement score, and then continue to the next mission. Your achievement score is calculated by adding up all of your explored world map cards and then subtracting three from that number for each time you were defeated in an encounter. At the end of the campaign, tally your score from all of the missions to see how you ranked. Campaign characters are units with energy abilities that can't attack or be attacked. They are placed in the campaign character slot when a mission or encounter specifies it. They are helpful units that assist you during encounters. Many units in the game have passive abilities, which simply occur without any action on the player's part. If a unit has this symbol next to any ability, it means the unit can use the ability while it's awaiting deployment or while it's in reserves if it's an enemy unit. If you are facing enemies in a terrain encounter, look for the symbol to the right of the terrain's name and see if it matches the symbol on any of the enemy units. If it does, those enemy units are on familiar ground and get whatever bonus ability it says next to the symbol. Move the unit up in its slot to reveal the familiar ground text. 
Traveler cards are acquired through various energy abilities and world map events. They are permanently added to a player's combat deck for the duration of the campaign. Both Traveler and Treasure cards can only be acquired once each per encounter. Boss units don't attack and have multiple energy abilities. They resolve their energy abilities first each combat turn. When a boss unit is fatigued, all other enemy units are fatigued and players win the encounter. Boss units can only be attacked if the second and third front row slot are both clear. Otherwise, allied unit abilities that make enemy units receive damage may still be used against the boss or enemy units in reserve slots. That completes this first tutorial. Travelers of Storia is an extremely fun game and truly does break new ground for deck building card gaming. I hope you'll all join me at www.travelersofstoria.com and watch for updates as well as an upcoming Kickstarter. Thank you for watching.